Phil Girona, and via telephone attorney at law, a legal counsel to uh, the program, uh, Joseph Jelly Tots Ferretti. Joe, good morning to you. Oh, wait a second. I need, to, I need to hit your button first. Sorry, Joe. There you are. Good morning. Hey, Rob, I appreciate that title, legal counsel to the radio show. I, yeah. I, I, I'll have to make sure I get that in writing with Mr. Hornby. <laughs> How's that retainer working out for you? <laughs> Yeah, I would say that retainer uh, hasn't amounted to a whole lot so far, but we'll have to revisit that issue next time I'm in Martinsburg. You're not getting now, Joe, anything but the residuals. I mean, even better as the time goes along. I would like just a small percentage of the advertising <laughs> revenue. Mr. Horby is Rob, Rob takes that already. Yeah. <laughs> he, he also introduces as, as jelly torts. Joey, Joey, Joe, I thought Joe. I heard jelly torts, no, and I wonder where that came from. Yeah. Phil, get donuts off your mind. <laughs> That's exactly what's going on over there. Holy cow. Have you not seen that picture of Joe that he sent in yeah. with, with, on the beach? On the beach. <laughs> Joey <laughs> torts, yeah. Amen. Uh, Joe, uh, last night uh, I reread the 47 page decision by the judges, the three judge panel. Uh, John and Bill have also familiarized themselves with the document. What stands out to you as you read through that document? Well, uh, uh, as an attorney, the first thing I'm looking for, Rob, when I read an order such as this, which includes what the courts refer to as findings of fact and conclusions of law, I'm looking to see how beef up the record is in terms of those findings of fact and in the what was it 47 pages of this court order there was uh, probably a majority of the writing was finding were findings of fact where the court the, the three judge panel went to great effort to as we say vouch the record and indicate what facts were determined as a result of the hearing that was conducted by the three judges in Jefferson County. And I thought they did a, an admirable job of specifying what facts they found and what they relied upon to then lead them to the conclusions of law, which they made in the last seven or eight pages of the order, where they indicate what their finding is, which is a finding of removal, and why that is supported in the law by those findings of fact. And as you will recall from reading that order, there were a, a, a really, they laid out the factual summary of, and it went by date by date as to what transpired, what was behind the decisions of the two commissioners to, to not attend, and how they believe that led to the findings of neglect and, and uh, basically uh, a failure to conduct the duties that are required uh, by their oath that they took in becoming county commissioners. So uh, I, first impression was it's a pretty complete, well-founded, uh, well-based, in fact, order. And so that gives the Supreme Court on appeal a lot of uh, information to go by when they conduct their the review of the uh, decision. On Friday on our program, two attorneys, Mike Carl and Larry Schultz, Mike from Bulls Rice, Larry from Burke Schultz, Harmon and Jenkinson, uh, not representing their firms with these opinions, but those are two respectable firms, uh, both stated they felt this would be overturned on appeal. What are your thoughts on that, Joe? Well, I, I wouldn't go that far as saying that I would anticipate this being overturned. And again, part of the reason is because of the, the order itself. Uh, I think any judge sitting in review of this, and I'm speaking of the five judges or justices down in, in Charleston, I think they're going to be satisfied that the hearing was conducted in such a way that the two county commissioners received their due process. They had a chance to present witnesses. They had a chance to present evidence. Uh, they had a chance to testify. And in light of all that, I think the court will first look at this and say, was due process granted to these two individuals? And I think the answer plainly will be yes. Secondly, now the appeal will, will also look at, okay, are there any legal questions or issues that perhaps are unresolved in the law or are uh, considered to be vague because of the way the statute is written, that would allow for some uh, 
review on appeal of whether or not the law is plainly written in such a way that it can be applied to those facts, that evidence. And there, I think that's what uh, both Mike and Larry were talking about, was that there's some legal nuances here. Uh, the issue that was raised about three commissioners versus five and things like that, that might give the Supreme Court pause as to whether or not uh, the law can be applied as it is currently written. Uh, this statute, 667, was last revised back in 2016 by uh, under a bill that was presented by Craig Blair uh, in, in the West Virginia Senate. Uh, I don't, to my knowledge, it has not been revised since then. Uh, but it clearly sets out the procedures to follow for removal of certain elected officials. And the Supreme Court will want to look at that language itself and see if legally there's a basis here to perhaps overturn the decision, maybe kick it back for another hearing with some clarifications on the law if they felt that the three-judge panel in, in some respects misapplied the law due to the vagueness of the statute itself. But I will tell you, my own personal opinion is that I think there's a better chance than not that this decision is going to be upheld. I want to ask about policy 305, which is mentioned earlier in the decision and later they kind of bring it back at the end. And they talk about the, the, the commissioners raised policy 305 as an objection and the court later said policy 305, which you tried to raise an objection, is actually the thing that is helping to lead to your removal. I'm paraphrasing. That's not the actual yeah. language here. But can you tell us about this policy 305 attempt that they made? Well, I'll tell you, I do not know chapter and verse about the actual uh, policy that exists in Jefferson County. That, that would take some real digging to figure out what, what it is that that uh, requires the county commission to do. But I suspect, and I believe this is true, perhaps Bill Silverfield can speak to this. I think this is true just about in, in every county commission across the state, that there are emergency guidelines in place for the county to handle certain indebtedness, certain bills or invoices that are pending so that the county doesn't get in trouble getting sued under some kind of collection suit. So for example, if a county commission was unable to develop a quorum because uh, let's say two county commissioners uh, took ill at approximately the same time, couldn't make meetings, the county has trouble conducting business, uh, there may be emergency provisions in place for the county to still handle certain indebtedness and invoices to avoid uh, delinquency in, in handling county debts. The two commissioners in Jefferson County raised that as a defense, claiming that one of the reasons why removal was sought was because the county was running behind on releasing bonds, paying bills, and things of that nature. And the, the two commissioners argued, well, we have a policy, 305, which allows the county commission to proceed with the payment of certain invoices and bills, uh, e even if the county commission is, is unable to meet. And the irony of all that, of course, was that the emergency created for Jefferson County was created by the two commissioners who were now then raising that as a defense. So I don't think the three judge panel w was particularly moved by that argument since the emergency in Jefferson County was created by those two commissioners and their decision not to attend the meetings. Uh, now, whether or not uh, the remaining commissioners, Tab and Stolliper, could have proceeded to pay some bills under Policy 305, I can't answer that because I don't know the policy specifically. But uh, I, I don't think as a defense to their removal petition, it was particularly persuasive for these two county commissioners to say, yes, we created the problem, but there was a means to fix it. Bill? Yeah, I think Joe's right that uh, at least in Berkeley County, if there, we did not have a quorum, uh, then the uh, the president of the commission or the president of the council uh, had the authority to go ahead and take action. John? Yeah, at the <clears throat> Tricia Jackson has already said on her Facebook page that she is going to appeal this decision. Is it possible, just in, in the way that courts work, is it possible that the, the appellate court, which I guess is the Supreme Court, uh, can take a look at the original decision and just say, no, this looks good, we'll let it stand as it is, or does the actual appeal process have to happen irrespective of, of how it turns out? Well, uh, John, good question, and it's still a process. Uh, that has to take place. Now, what the statute requires, or, or really what it says for the Supreme Court, is that uh, they can review, and they most likely in this case will review, 
the decision of the three judge panel just based on the papers, documents, and evidence submitted. They won't have a separate hearing, uh, but they will do a review of the documentary evidence, the testimony. There'll be, of course, a transcript of the hearing uh, that's presented to the Supreme Court, and their review will consist of a review of that information. And if they believe that the three-judge panel, again, provided the process that was due to these two county commissioners, then the Supreme Court, if they feel the law has been applied appropriately and this, the law is clear enough, the Supreme Court will uphold the decision. Uh, now, your question is, will they kick it out quickly or will they you know, have a, a full hearing? Again, they won't have a formal hearing. They'll do a review of everything and then issue a, an order, pretty much a writ, uh, commanding that the uh, three-judge panel order be enforced. And what, uh, now, that's on, that's on their timetable, though, John. I, I don't, the, the statute doesn't specify when the Supreme Court has to act. And what effect, if any, does this decision have on any future criminal uh, liability? There's, there's a criminal trial coming sometime in the future. Are they treated separately? Is the evidence from the civil trial part of... And, and the outcome of the civil trial, their, their removal, is that part of the evidentiary uh, presentation in the uh, criminal trial as well? Oh, it could be. Uh, the, the fact that some witnesses may be the same and the fact that those witnesses were under oath and testified at this civil proceeding, uh, you know, that's, that's a record. And, and they can be uh, examined and cross-examined based upon their prior testimony. Interestingly, the two uh County Commissioners Justice and Jackson and Kraus took the fifth when they were on the stand. They asserted their Fifth Amendment rights uh, to uh, not be compelled to testify against their own interests. So there is no record of these two uh, county commissioners having testified because they asserted their Fifth Amendment right in the civil proceeding. Now, in the civil proceeding, that can be used against them. It is an inference that the testimony they would have provided would have been adverse to their own interests because they asserted the fit. That is a unique characteristic of a civil proceeding and the Fifth Amendment assertion. But in a criminal matter, uh, that cannot be argued in any fashion. Uh, th there's no inference. Uh, all criminal defendants have a right to, to not testify. So there will be no argument, no inference uh, that any judge or jury will assume is in place if they choose not to testify in the criminal hearing. But the rest of the record that's developed in the civil proceedings, since it's submitted uh, under the rules of evidence and, and testimony under oath, can be considered in the criminal proceedings. And if, hypothetically, this is overturned at an appeal, does, does all of that then get wiped away, that it is no longer legitimate to be presented at the criminal trial? Oh, no. Uh, we're, we're, you're dealing with different standards of proof. And there are different types of charges involved in the criminal realm versus the civil realm. The civil case was only about removal from office. There was, and it's, the standard of evidence there is clear and convincing evidence to get someone removed from an elected office. But the criminal charges, which are different in nature and form, uh, those can still be pursued even if there is an overturning of the civil removal order that's in place. However, you, know, you can well imagine if, if I'm a prosecuting attorney in this case and I'm sitting on criminal charges that are pending and the Supreme Court kicks back the civil proceeding and overturns the findings of the three-judge panel, I'm going to be a little less confident about proceeding with criminal charges, which requires a higher standard of proof, the beyond reasonable doubt standard of proof, to uh, get a conviction. So th while... Practically speaking, there's going to be maybe some reexamination of those criminal charges if this decision is reversed civilly. Uh, it will the prosecution can still go forward regardless of what happens at the civil side. Mike, there is some uh, question on our Facebook page in regards to the legislation passed updating the three member commissions to five. Why it doesn't kick in until January one, as opposed to say July one. So I believe that decision was made so that it did not affect this election. Um, and, and we're going through this, and you know, we don't we try not to change laws in the middle 
especially when it comes to elect, uh, electing people, try not to make those decisions um, then. So I believe that was a decision made by the uh, majority leader and that, that, yeah. that they made it for January, January 1. Bill? Yeah, I'm... I found this discussion to be very informative, both from uh, Eric and from uh, uh, Derek rather than you, Joe. Uh, I'm still a little confused with the puts and takes uh, that appeal sets down one one track, uh, the non-appeal sets down another track. Uh, are you comfortable that we're going to be able to get all this resolved so by next election or the general election we'll have something clear in front of the voters? Yeah, I, it's uh, and looking back at other cases, and, and look, w one thing we were always guilty of is that we think, oh, boy, this is something unique to Jefferson County or this is just local politics. And, boy, isn't it a mess here in Jefferson County? This happens all over the state. Uh, it, it, there was a sheriff removed in a county not long ago uh, over towards the uh, Ohio River. Nicholas County, uh, there were two petitions filed against county commissioners for basically uh, allegations of self-dealing and, and incompetence. And both of those petitions failed. Uh, and the Supreme Court, uh, in, in one case, kicked it back and, and reversed the decision of a three-judge panel. So uh, there's a process in place. I suspect that there's no need to anticipate that it's going to take longer than perhaps a few months now. The term of court for the Western Supreme Court of Appeals runs, I think, until the last part of June. Uh, typically, they're out in July and August. Uh, so whether or not they can get something done before their, this term of court expires is, is a real question. But uh, I, I got to believe that th this hearing took uh, a few days and the record is not all that voluminous that the, the uh, justices couldn't sit down and review it and decide whether or not uh, again, due process was granted to these two commissioners well in advance of the general election date. Joe, appreciate, as always, your participation on the program and making that which is complex sound understandable. Or even more Well, I, I, it, it is a – look, I, I listened to Dee Kersey, and it was – this is a very complicated area. And unfortunately, the, the statute does not contemplate all these different permutations – regarding uh, uh, the temporary appointments to fill vacancies and appeals and things of that nature. While this does happen all over the state, fortunately, it, it's not all that common. So the law perhaps is not as developed as uh, one would hope. But in this particular case, I think based on my review, Barab, and what I've seen so far with the uh, court order and the three-judge panel and how they conducted affairs, it uh, looks like to me it's so far so good in terms of, of uh, again, making sure that there is due process and that there's a proper procedure taking place regarding what is really a drastic remedy here. Removal of elected officials is something we don't uh, want to do or like to do, I'm sure, but uh, sometimes it becomes necessary and uh, at least three judges saw it that way. And I was struck in the, in the language in this, Joe, about how the lack of attendance played such a large role in this in combination with the Facebook comments that the two commissioners were posting while not attending. Yeah, social media is going to be the death of us all. <laughs> and in this case, it played a large role. Uh, I mean, they, they verbatim were pulling up social media postings by these two commissioners, and they were doing it to establish that one of the reasons why they were refusing to come to work was because of political differences with uh, the individuals who were nominated by the county executive committee to fill the vacancy. Uh, when you start applying a litmus test as to whether or not the individuals nominated by that committee are conservative enough, uh, that's not a basis for refusing to engage and decide who's going to fill this vacancy. It, that, that was purely a political move. And that is not contemplated by any statute in West Virginia as to why you shouldn't report to work as a public official. And so their social media postings really played a part uh, in establishing uh, not only the reasons why they didn't come to work, but also to uh, really uh, counteract the arguments of their counsel at the three judge panel hearing as to some of the technical reasons why they were choosing not to come to work, such as, 
Uh, the nomination process was invalid. Mr. Lowry, who was one of the candidates nominated, uh, had a conflict of interest, things of that nature. That kind of falls flat as an argument when you're on Facebook revealing the true reasons why you don't want to take part in this uh, this nomination and selection process. So, yeah, social media played a part. Joe, thanks so much. Appreciate your time this morning. Okay, fellas. Have a good one. Talk take to care. you Friday. Thanks, Joe. Attorney at Law, Joseph Joey Totz, Ferretti at 1054.